echo of his voice has been my inspiration. His courage, love, and passion in life has sustained me since his death. And I, Elizabeth Custer, will always remain the keeper of his flame. I know many of you have a vividly drawn picture well established in your minds of the man you will fondly hear me refer to as Otty. He gave himself the name Otty when as a small child he was unable to pronounce Armstrong. I will not ask you to change the beliefs you hold. I ask only that you listen to my story of the man whose life and adventure spirit I gratefully shared. Otty's love of family, books, the theater, riding, animals, especially dogs and horses, and our very special devotion to one another goes far beyond what is perceived by the public. <laughs> Where do I begin? You know, maybe I should take you back to Monroe, Michigan. Audie and I came from two very different backgrounds, and that fact alone was an obstacle not to be taken lightly. My father, Judge Bacon's primary objections to Otty were his poor prospects for the future and his distress at the thought of me having to endure the trials and tribulations of a soldier's wife. Little did he know, I couldn't have chosen a lifestyle I relished more. Now, Otty had work for my family, doing odd jobs before either of us entertained ideas of romance. But after West Point and during the Civil War, we viewed each other in a whole new light. At a party held around Thanksgiving, 1862, we were formally presented to one another. Of course, Audie would never let me forget the time when in our childhood, I, while swinging on my front gate, shouted to him as he passed, Hey, you, Custer boy! That in sheer terror I bolted for the house. I uh, respected my father's objections, which permitted us only limited contact. I had my fair share of admirers, but I must admit, George Armstrong Custer possessed a manner and energy I had not encountered before, but I was not of a mind to go against my father's wishes and seek a forbidden romance. Audie's nature, on the other hand, was not reined in by any such encumbrance. Upon winning the Silver Star of General, he felt empowered in his bid to win my heart, but first he knew he had to win over my father. His diligent pursuit and tenacious yet wily attack was worthy of military commendation. He took every opportunity to make my father aware of his promotion to general at the age of 23 and his military exploits on the field of battle. Even my formidable father eventually surrendered under such a barrage of fortitude and valor. Audie later confided in me. He would have let nothing stand in the way of making me his wife. He knew my heart better than I did. Who was I to resist? While I was always the keeper of the flame of love, he always knew how to fan that flame. We were finally married on February 9, 1864, in the First Presbyterian Church of Monroe. And what I had originally conceived as a simple ceremony grew into a rather ostentatious occasion, for which I must plainly admit I'm not sorry. My father even referred to it as the most splendid wedding ever seen in the state. Now after our marriage and honeymoon, Audie secured a place for me to live in Washington, D.C. While billeted in the capital, I had the occasion to socialize with some of the nation's notables. I even had the opportunity of meeting President Lincoln at a White House reception. He shook hands with me, and upon the mention of my name, he again took my hand and said, So, this is the young woman whose husband goes into a charge with a whoop and a shout. Well, I'm told he won't do that anymore. I replied I hoped he would. Oh, he said jokingly, Then you want to be a widow, I see. He laughed, and I did likewise. But I would be lying to say that I did not experience anxious moments. All fears evaporated when I heard the sound of cavalry boots mounting the stairs two at a time and the familiar clank of a saber. For whatever time Audie and I had together away from the front, I held the war and my fears at bay. But I also began a tradition that would persist throughout our marriage. Wherever he went, I went too, and daily letters of some length 
help fill the void when we were apart. We were finally reunited at Fort Leavenworth and soon after we're on our way to Fort Hayes, marching to the strains of Gary Owen. My welcome to Fort Hayes, though, was less than auspicious. For soon after our arrival, a tornado of wind and rain beat on the canvas roof of our tent like a trip hammer. I awakened Audie with a conjugal joggle, and as was his custom, he answered in a chiding manner. Ah, indeed, I'm uh, pleased to be informed of so important a fact. Well, despite Audie's efforts, the tent blew over, so he rolled me up in blankets and carried me through the blinding rain to a neighbor's Sibley tent, which has no corners. Next morning, he dressed me in his underclothing and dropped me in a pair of cavalry boots. I covered this costume as best I could with my wet dress, but uh, needless to say, I was no fashion plate. But as long as we could be together, the tent could go down nightly for all I cared. Those were some of the happiest hours, in spite of clomping about that tent in those old troop boots, because we were together. Oh, I must also tell you the time when riding with a general and an orderly on a smooth stretch of land with our horses going full tilt, Audie reached toward me with one powerful arm and lifted me up out of the saddle and held me in midair for a moment. I clung to my reins with a hope I would again find my way back into my saddle. I had read of this feat in some dime novel, but thought it practiced only in print until I found myself suspended above my horse. When again seated, I swallowed hard to remove my heart from my throat and turned to look at the orderly whose eyes were as big as saucers and Audie with a devilish look in his. It was there also I made the acquaintance of Wild Bill Hickok, who carved out his place on the frontier and in history. And to my delight, there was no summer campaign to interrupt this pleasant state. Striking summer camp at Fort Hayes, though, was difficult for me. Despite the harsh climate and barren terrain, the experiences and companions we shared our canvas community with will live forever in my memory. Even the menagerie of wild pets, everything from wolves and buffalo calves to rattlesnakes. I also believe myself to be one of the first women to accompany a buffalo hunt. On May 17th, the 7th moved out, led by the band playing The Girl I Left Behind Me. It was early in the morning as the column rode out, and as the bright sunlight began to dispel the fog and mist through which they rode, it created a most unusual sight. As it appeared, the column was marching into the heavens. It was a fascinating illusion, but above all to me, it was an omen. I camped with Audie that first night, and when we parted next day, I threw my arms around his neck, and with tears in his eyes, he said, I'll be back soon, Libby, and we'll have good times again. I turned around for one last glance at the column, my husband rode to the top of a promontory, stood up in his stirrups and waved his hat. I never saw him again. On June 25th, Audie's last written message read, Come on, big village, bring packs, come quick. Soldiers' wives fight a hundred battles in their minds without ever drawing a pistol. When Audie was away, even my dreams were ravaged by painted and feathered warriors pitted against the seventh and fateful conflict. Every day without a letter was ominous. The fear of not knowing gnaws at your very being. In that spring of 1876, my heart was gripped by an ice-cold fear that turned into a horrifying reality. On June 25th, I and the other officers' wives were gathered round the piano in our parlor to sing and hopefully by doing so alleviate our restlessness. In the middle of the hymn, Near My God to Thee, I was consumed by a chill like no other, that not even my shawl could protect me from or warm me. It was as if time was suspended. Hundreds of miles away, my husband, my friend, my lover, were shrouded in the dust and gun smoke of battle. If 
fighting odds and an enemy from which he would not walk away with no one left to tell a tale. He is locked in mortal combat throughout all history. 261 men, friends, family, brothers in arms were no more. Their bravery, their terrifying cries, their last breaths echo across the plains and my heart forever. When word arrived at Fort Lincoln, we officers' wives were cooling ourselves on the front porch. After hearing those dreadful words, we all quietly withdrew ourselves to our individual homes. I stepped into the darkened hallway, and the full impact of the news I had received struck me. I had so often wondered how I would or could handle those devastating words. My senses reeled, and my heart was inconsolable. Time eased but does not completely heal such a loss. Tears would fill the lonely hours. The world and the man I so loved were forever gone.